Hello everyone, I'm Danny Byrne for the Web Seller Circle and I'd like to welcome you to this final part of the presenter series. Today we're going to talk about part two in making a retail ready product. Last week Cindy talked about how Camtasia works. This week we're going to look at how to take a Camtasia recording and turn it into something you can burn to disc and sell. Today on Retail Ready. What makes a retail product? We're going to talk about a few things before we start the demonstration just to put the demos themselves into some sort of context. The PowerPoint part of this is going to be very short, I hope, and we can get right into the demonstrations. What makes a retail ready product different from just a handmade product? One is attention to detail a polished presentation and professional packaging. Now what is attention to detail? One of the most important parts is a musical score. You will frequently find videos up on YouTube, instructional videos, camcorder videos, all kinds of stuff without music, but I don't think you'll be able to name one movie even in the silent era through today that didn't have music in it. If you're going to make a retail ready product, you want to have some sort of music in the background. And for most of us who aren't composers, that means royalty free music. We'll talk a little bit more about what that is and where to get it in a few minutes, but for now, let me just say that you probably are going to use a short piece of music, 10 seconds or less in your intro and in your exit, and perhaps, depending on your subject matter, you might have underscore some background music to keep things moving and to keep people's uh, attention and uh, get them in the mood. You also, in a retail-ready product, want to take the time to highlight what's important to your viewers. When you're making a product or you're just recording a webinar and posting it, a lot of people just take it and put it up and you'll be looking at an unmoving PowerPoint for an hour. That's pretty boring and it's also sometimes very hard to see the details. If you're trying to sell this product, then you don't want to just give people a treasure map. You want to show them how X marks the spot. So take a second in fact, take several minutes and go through and mark out the most important parts of the presentation so that your viewer does not have to hunt for them. And then edit ruthlessly to remove anything that's unnecessary. Again, when we record from the web, which we're doing tonight, for instance, there'll be periods where as you change screens, there's dead air. There might be a little white. You'll be looking at that Windows hourglass as it takes time for a web page to load. That can't be avoided in a live presentation, but there's no reason that people watching a recording should be subjected to it. Your job as the producer of this video is to edit those things out. Remember, there are just things that no one needs to see. Now, when you pay this kind of attention to detail, you're going to realize that you're spending quite a bit of time editing your videos. As a general rule of thumb, if you're familiar with all the software you're using, it's going to take at least three to five times as long to edit the material as it did to create it in the first place. So if you have a one hour webinar that you want to turn into a CD for sale, plan on spending a minimum of three hours, more likely five to ten hours, getting that video ready because there are a lot of details beyond just recording it and burning it to disk. Now we mentioned a polished presentation as part of a retail ready product. This is something that a lot of people skip over. When we're talking live, there's pauses while you stop and try to collect your thoughts. There are places where you say um and ah. All of us have verbal tics. You may say uh, you know a lot. You may say so now let's 
while you're trying to think. We all do things like that. Live, it's there. Recorded, take them out. If you make a mistake while you're talking and you trip over your words, just edit the whole thing out. In fact, you may find when you're doing a live presentation, there are times when you say the exact opposite of what you mean and you give people incorrect information. In a live presentation, sometimes you catch it and you say, oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to say click here, I meant to say never click here. But that's just confusing when you're watching a CD and there's no one else listening, you can't ask questions. So go back and edit out your mistakes, clean it up. If your sound is bad, re-record re it. You're not making a historical record of your webinar. You're making a product that people want to pay for. Don't worry that you're cheating by cleaning up your mistakes. What you're doing is being generous to your audience. Go back, redo, and clean up. And when you're making these presentations, try to tell a story. Engage your viewers' emotions somehow. Do the unexpected. If you look at TV or movies, you'll notice that it almost never starts with the credits. And yet almost all the video we see on the web starts with the credits. This is a bit of a problem. This year, the Web Seller Circle is going to try something new with our YouTube videos. Instead of starting at the beginning and going credits, A, B, C, D, we're going to start with D. Show people what the finished project will be when they do whatever it is we're trying to explain. Then show the credits, then show the demonstration. If you think about it, this is a lot more like what you normally see on TV. You start by engaging your audience. They're not going to be very interested in who you are. You want to get their emotions tied in, get their interest, and then let them know who you are. And also, if you do things in this way, we're hoping that you'll keep people tuned into our videos a lot longer. You don't have very long on YouTube to get people watching. So if you have a long introduction and nothing's happening, people click out. And the last element is we're going to talk about tonight is professional packaging. This goes a lot with knowing your audience's expectations. Now, if you're selling uh, CDs on eBay, say you're making MP3s of your podcasts and you're selling them on eBay, you may very well get away with burning those on your home computer, putting them in a paper sleeve, putting that sleeve in a bubble wrap and sending it to people eBay audiences don't expect to always receive retail products. On the other hand, if you're selling the same CD on Amazon and you go about it in the same way, you will be thrown off Amazon because you'll get so many returns. People on Amazon will identify that not as a homemade CD, but as a bootleg. So you have to have professional packaging that meets the expectations of your audience. Look at what your competitors are doing and try to do something similar. If they're selling their CDs and DVDs and Amray cases, those are those big cases that DVDs come in, they're called Amray, then you should be doing that. If their discs are silk screened, full color silk screen discs, then you should be. If the how-to books have discs on the back cover, inside back cover, then yours should. Try to aim to emulate the professionals who are very successful. You want your product to look like a product that was made by somebody who sells 500 a day, not five a year. So look to the pros and try to do what they do. And make sure you have the tools you need to get the job done right. You can find sometimes free or very inexpensive substitutes for a lot of these tools, but it's not going to do you very much good. What you're going to end up with is sometimes not as good a product and oftentimes five times as much work. Don't try to cut down a tree with a handsaw. Somebody's made the right tool. Invest in yourself and your business and get that tool. If you're talking about screencasting, then what you're talking about if you have a PC is Camtasia. 
If you have a Mac, it's either Camtasia or ScreenFlow. You have a choice of two excellent products for the Mac now. Yes, it's expensive, but it does a lot of work for you, and it does so much better a job than cheaper products. One of the things you're paying for in Camtasia, now this is just one of them, is the codec that compresses the video. Those codecs are licensed, and they cost quite a lot of money. You can go out and you can buy the Onto Flash Encoder yourself for $399, or you can get it as part of Camtasia. They paid a licensing fee. Obviously, if you go out and you buy some kind of screencasting software that costs $29.95, it's not going to have that $400 codec in it. It's probably going to have some open source thing that doesn't do the same sort of tight professional compression. So it's worth getting the professional product. Camtasia you can find from TechSmith at www.techsmith.com slash camtasia.asp. ScreenFlow is made by Telestream. They're at www.telestream.net, ScreenFlow forward slash overview dot htm. Both products have trial downloads, so you can give them a shot, see how they work, and then you can either download the product or you can order, at least for Camtasia, you can order a disc for an additional fee as well as the download. Now, you know the old saying that if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Don't fall into that trap with your videos. I know several people who do all of their editing in Camtasia, and that's not where you should be if you're doing full motion video. If you use a camcorder at some point to make your videos, then go to a nonlinear video editing package like Sony Movie Studio. It's not very expensive. In fact, Movie Studio only costs $40. There are several tiers of products and it goes up to $600, but the $40 one will give you everything you need to make a good retail product. Don't try to do it in Camtasia. You'll have unsmooth, kind of jerky video because it doesn't have the right codex to compress full motion video. We mentioned royalty-free music, and this is where I usually get mine. Digital Juice, which is digitaljuice.com, all one word, makes something called Stack Tracks. And what these are are royalty-free tracks where each song will be made up of a series of tracks with instruments all on their own track. So that, for instance, if you have guitars, drums, another guitar, like a, a bass guitar and a harmonica, you can turn those on and off individually, which will give you very different sounds. Maybe you just really like that bass line to add a little uh, menace to your video, but the harmonica is just not working at all if you're trying to make it dark and scary. So you can just drop the harmonica out. It's a really neat product. They have 50 or 60 different CDs worth of it. There are about 20, 20 different songs on each CD, and each song will come in different loops, 10 seconds, 15, 30, 60, and full length. So you get a lot of music. The price varies. They go on sale. They come off sale. But if you do a lot of video work, look at Digital Juice. If you just need one or two free loops, and that's like a 10-second little bit of music, Look at SoundSnap. That's SoundSnap.com. They are a website that's been put together by professional sound artists from Hollywood who were dissatisfied with the quality of special effects that they could find on the web. SoundSnap is free. You'll be asked to sign up and join, but it's free. And you get some of the most amazing sound effects as well as musical loops there for free, made by people who have worked on very large Hollywood productions. You can look at the credentials of the people who are uploading the sounds just for fun, and you'll see people from Terminator movies and Batman movies and a lot of things where sound is really important. So SoundSnap is a great resource. 
And finally, if you just want to buy a track or two that you can license for commercial use on a CD, look at Dawn Music. The website is D-A-W-N without the periods, dawnmusic.com, all one. And you can buy individual tracks for just a couple of dollars. When I signed up, they had a special where uh, new people got a credit for $20 worth of music. I think that's still on, so it's certainly worth signing up and investigating. And it's got a very large library of royalty-free music. Now, royalty-free music, in case you're not familiar with it, that doesn't mean the music itself is necessarily free. You're probably going to pay for it. What it does mean is that you do not have to pay a royalty to the composer every time you use the music. So if you just go out, grab something off your iPod, put it into your uh, CD, sell the CD on Amazon, you are supposed to pay the composer of that song. Like you take Born to Run, you put it on the back of your videos and the back of your CDs and when it's over, you know, you say Tram Slot Toss Baby, we're born to run and Bruce Springsteen's guitar comes up. You have to pay him for that. <laughs> That's not free. Every single time that CD is played, Bruce Springsteen is owed a royalty. And this can get really expensive. Now, if you're just doing this on your own in your house with your friends, making a few copies to hand out in the back of the room, maybe you'll never get caught. But when you're selling on Amazon, you have to act like a professional, and that means that you have to have licenses for your music. So you want royalty-free music. You're going to have to make pictures. You never bought a CD that didn't have a picture on the case or on the disc. You want a professional editor for your images, and I recommend Adobe Photoshop. I'm going to upload to the Web Seller Circle a template to use with Kanaki, who we'll talk about in a minute, for the CD cases, uh, the DVD cases, and for the discs themselves. And that'll be a Photoshop template. So if you want to use it effectively, you're going to need a copy of Photoshop. And you're going to need box shot software. If you make a non-physical product like an ebook, you'll sell a lot more if you have a picture of a virtual product, which is to say you make something that looks like a book, but it's, it's clear to people that this is an ebook. You're not trying to deceive with this product. You're just trying to help people visualize. So even if you're making things that really exist, like DVDs, or uh, you're putting products on memory cards, it's very hard to take good pictures of those products. It's much easier to use box shot software. I use two products, Quick 3D Cover and True Box Shot. I'm going to demonstrate Quick 3D Cover tonight. There are others available, and if you keep your eye on giveawayoftheday.com, they have free box shot software every so often. So that's something you might want to think about there as well. And finally, you've made your disc. You have to duplicate your disc in retail packaging. Where do you do that? I use a service called Kanaki. And the other service that uh, you'll probably want to think about is CreateSpace. That's owned by Amazon. It's more expensive than Kanaki, but it has better customer service, which is not hard because Kanaki has no customer service. And it also gets you directly into the Amazon catalog at a better discount than you would get if you went in through Amazon Advantage. It's uh, something you have to weigh for yourself which way you want to go. If you're going to dis take care of distributing your discs and you expect to sell your products in several locations or in several different ways, Kanaki will save you money. If you're just trying to get on Amazon, CreateSpace will save you some headaches. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. So let's just go and look at it. Let's start by looking at Camtasia. This is the start of my edit for the presentation Cindy did last week. As you can see, I've only edited the first half hour of her thing. But if we look at it, every one of these little diamonds here is a zoom and pan frame. Every one of these marks here is a call out. And you can't see it right here, but I've also used what's called the pip track over here to uh, add something on top of the playback screen. 
Now, not every product will have the same amount of call-outs and zooms and pans and all of that stuff, but you do want to keep your screen moving. We can't have the same kind of movement that you have in a Hollywood production, but we can at least keep something happening to keep people's attention. Now, you notice here I've stacked call-outs. You don't have to have just one. We don't have enough video memory while we're streaming to actually show, unfortunately, the um, picture itself. So you're just going to have to take my word for it that if you have something like a circle around the item and an arrow pointing to it, that would be a stack callout. One of these is a custom callout. It shows the keyboard key F10 and right next to it is a text callout that says to stop. If we were listening to this playback, you'd hear Cindy say at that point, press F10 to stop, and the custom callout comes out showing you what an F10 key looks like in case you didn't quite catch what she said or didn't understand it. Things like that happen all throughout your movie, and that's one way to keep your viewer engaged. The other thing I want to show you about last week's product, we can't see the cuts that are made. Once things are removed from the timeline, they're gone. But you can see the time here. It's 57.47, and that's with only editing on the first 27 minutes. This video started out, uh, it was actually an hour and 13. But say about 10 minutes of that was just dead air time bef from the beginning and the end where we were getting set up. So don't count that. We've still cut out about three to five minutes here of video already in the first half hour of a one hour video. A lot of that is just um and ah and you know. You ruthlessly edit your soundtrack. You listen to it over and over again and take out the parts where you stumble, where you pause, where you misspeak. It's slow and time consuming but it really makes a huge difference to your audience. Cindy did a really good job last week of showing you how to do all that, so I'm not going to cover it again. So let's just say we've done all the editing we're going to do here on this particular video, and now we want to produce it. This is where Camtasia has many more tools than any similar product does. So the first thing we have to do is render it. You come over here and you click produce video as and this wizard comes up. If you're going to do this for YouTube or your own blog or website, you may want to just use the presets here for the web or CD or whatever. They're not bad. They're pretty good presets. But if you're making a retail product, I recommend you come down to custom setting. Then click next. Now you're going to choose which formats you want. And for retail ready products, I strongly urge you to use either AVI, that's this one, AVI, or Flash. Here's the difference. AVI is an uncompressed video format. Technically, it can be viewed on any computer, but the TechSmith Kodak doesn't work with Mac. AVI, although it'll give you the clearest, cleanest pictures, will be able to be seen only under Windows. So you'll have to tell your Mac users, if you have a lot of them, that they have to play this under Parallels or you'll give them your, their money back. Flash can be played on Windows and Macs and that may seem to be a big advantage. On the other hand, quality is not quite as good and Flash has problems. Some people won't have the latest versions of Flash. They'll get messages saying they have to upgrade to Flash 9 and they only have 7 and they freak out and they don't want to do it. They think it's a virus or Flash sometimes crashes people's computers. It's a little bit of a trade-off. You'll know your own audience. Look at your web statistics. If you have one or two people that use Macs and a hundred people that use Windows PCs, then go with AVI and see if there's some way you can help out your Mac users by making a special edition for them. If you have a large Mac audience, then use the flash output and just try to optimize it as best you can. Right now, I'm going to walk you through setting up an AVI video. So you click AVI and you click Next. We're doing this, remember, for sale. 
the presets I pick here would be different if we were doing this for YouTube. So take notes if you want to, but don't use them to make a YouTube video. Won't hurt anything, but it'll give you a much bigger file than what you need. There are better ways to do YouTube. So your colors, if you pick automatic, it will just take the color values from your project, and that should be fine. Frame rate, 15 frames per second, should be fine. This isn't full motion video, it's a screen video, and that means most of the time you're just redrawing very small portions. Maybe your cursor's moving around like this, or you're opening and closing windows. But by and large, you're not redrawing every pixel on the screen all the time. So you don't need to have a really high frame rate. You can click the video compression tab, and you'll see there are a lot to choose from. Just stick with the TechSmith Capture codec. The important thing here is the keyframe every 30 seconds. This will give you very good quality video at a reasonable size. You can boost up how many frames you can say every 15 seconds and get uh, even smoother video, but it's, you reach a point where the video itself is so large that the computer can't play it and it stutters and you lose any of that extra quality. So keyframe 30, frame rate 15, encode audio should be checked, Interleave audio every one second, that's fine. Click over to audio format. This is another place where you may have to compromise between size and quality. Your best sound will be PCM 44 kilohertz, 16-bit stereo. That is near CD quality sound. That's about as good as you're going to get on a home computer. It's also going to give you a very large file. If you have to make this file a little bit smaller, do so by dropping it down to 22 and stereo or 22 and mono, 16-bit. That will give you a somewhat smaller file. If you still have a problem and it's still too big, then you're going to have to compress it to like an MP3. Um, and again, you're going to want to get to 44 or 22 or something like that. Um, but make the MP3 your last choice, not your first choice. There can be problems with an MP3. You get something that sounds a little bit like Alvin and the Chipmunks if uh, you have the wrong codec installed on your computer. That almost never happens with uncompressed sound. What I would recommend, you can see it right here, is... PCM uncompressed 22.5 millihertz 16 bits mono. For voice mono actually works fine. Stereo makes it a little better. And then click next. Now the size of your video, that's another thing that changes. The best video to get in Camtasia is if you can record, produce, and render all at the same size. That will give you the clearest of all pictures. So maybe you can record your screen at 1024 by 768, you can edit at 1024 by 768, and you can produce at 1024 by 768. You'll have a very, very, very big file, but it'll be very clear. For most people, that's just not possible. And if you're doing something that's more than like 15 minutes long, it's way too big to even put on a CD. Probably on a CD, you're going to want to record your screen at whatever resolution. I'm going to say 1024, but if you have widescreen, obviously, it's going to be a little bit different. And then try and fit it in. I would recommend 800 by 600. There's something called aspect ratios, and the squarer, older screens, those are 4 by 3. Wide screen, those are 16 by 9, and that means for every 16 inches long it is, it's 9 inches high. So things stay in proportion. You want to maintain aspect ratio. It's very important to do that. So if you're recording at the older non-widescreen resolution. Try to go 800 by 600. And you'll get that to fit on most people's monitors. Also keep in mind, things don't always fit on everyone's monitor. They say it's 1024 by 768, but there's room on the bottom you have to have for the controls, and, and you don't want people scrolling and, and missing parts of it. So really, 
800 by 600, even though monitors are getting bigger, 800 by 600 is still sort of the lowest common denominator. And when you're selling publicly on something like Amazon and have no idea who you're selling to, you do have to produce some things that will fit older computers as well as newer ones. Click Next. Now, video info. This isn't terribly important for disk, uh, but you can put your name and your information here. This is usually up on the web. It'll be encoded in, especially if you're using iTunes. SCORM is uh, about an e-learning thing. Just ignore it. Watermarks, don't use them. That's very unprofessional. AVI, you do not need to embed, so uncheck that. Then click Next. We haven't talked at all about how to use markers to make a table of contents, so we're going to just leave all of this blank for now. Give your product a name, put it in a folder, click Finish, and Camtasia will render it. That's how you would make this as an AVI. What if you decided you want to make it as a Flash movie? You, for any number of reasons, want to do it as Flash instead. Again, you click it, you go to Next. Camtasia is going to recommend what it thinks is your best option. In this case, because I showed you we have something on the PIP, it's trying to make me use one video with PIP. Otherwise, we won't see that part. Most of the time, I would recommend you use Express Show. Then you want to click Flash Options. If you have Camtasia 5, you'll only have two formats of Flash, SWF, which, as they say, is good for short, slow, low motion, or FLV, which is good for longer or videos with more motion. In Camtasia 6, they introduced MP4s, which are slowly becoming adopted as the new web standard flash rather than FLVs or SWIFTs. If you have MP4s with a .264 codec, I would say use it. You'll get the best quality from that. Otherwise, you're probably going to use FLVs, uh, just in the nature of things. So you, you're not going to, you might have 10 or 15 five-minute videos, but by and large, most of us are not going to do that. We'll have uh, a couple of FLVs. So click that, then come down here. Again, the frame rate, I would never go higher than 15 if there's not a lot of movement. If it's a thing like this where it's a lot of talk and you're just occasionally changing, I would might very well drop it down to 10. 10 to 15 should do you. It'll depend a little bit. Look at your product. Do it both ways and see if you see a difference. Bit rate is how quickly they can stream across uh, either your computer or the web. If you're doing this on the web, then you have to limit the bit rate. Otherwise, you're in a lot of trouble. When you're doing it for CD, set it to no limit, and that will let your computer run it as quickly as it can, giving you the smoothest picture. Bitrate control, again, if you're doing this for YouTube, you want it constant. If you're doing it for a CD, do variable two-pass. Right now, I don't have time to explain why I'm telling you to do these things. Just take my word for it right now. 15 frames per second, no limit, variable, two pass will give you the best quality FLV. Make your quality slider all the way over to high quality. And your keyframes every five seconds, that should be fine. Then go to audio and you have the exact same choices as we had on FLVs and I would recommend you do the exact same thing. Get the best file you can with the best size. Try to stay uncompressed. If it makes everything much too large, go to MP3s, but try dropping down um, from 44 to 22 kilohertz before you go to MP3. Your volume slider is the slider on the playback, and I like to keep it around 85% so that the video's not playing, it's not blasting when it comes on, and people have the opportunity to either turn it up or turn it down. Controls. A lot of this is, is individual, what you like to do. I like to have them pause at the start because I think, you know, the people who are playing the video should be able to decide if they want to just cue it up and not start it right away. On the other hand, some people 
feel like the video's broken because nothing happens. They put it in and it just sits there. So know your audience and figure out whether you want it to pause or not. I don't usually check any of the other boxes here. I don't, I don't think you need to have that go on. The About Show box, this is another thing that's on the video playback, and it's where you can put your copyright information, and I usually do under the display text. I, under About, I put the uh, web seller circle in the, the year or whatever. Uh, start and end screen doesn't have anything to do with um, what we're doing in a DVD or a CD that's online. And the same thing with end action. Uh, online you can have, uh, when the video ends, you can have a jump to a web page or go back to certain parts um, if you're doing tests. But on a CD, you just stop at the end. Say apply or say OK then you're going to fit it in the size. And again, this is the same question we had before. Is it 800 by 600? Is it 640 by 480? What's your size? This depends a little bit on how you're going to play it. If you're going to play it on a, on a screen with a table of contents, and a lot of Swifts are played that way, you don't want the biggest size. You want probably 640, maybe 8 by 6, but no bigger than that because you have to leave room for your table of contents. If this size isn't what you want, you change dimensions here by fit it, fitting it in a certain width or picking a custom width and letting Camtasia the, fit the controls. See, the video itself is 640 by 480, but the controls down here, the thing that you start and stop, that's going to take another 18, 19 pixels, and so they make the whole size fit inside a frame of 640 by 498. <clears throat> then you click Next. This is all the same as what you saw in the other one, except now it's very important to embed this in HTML. Always embed your Swifts and your FLVs in HTML. Click Next, and again, give it a name, and you're ready to go.